Good morning. morning. And welcome to Kingdom Praise Ministries. Woo! I pray that y'all had a blessed week last week, and we're looking forward to an even better week this week. Uh, I hope you were able to join us this morning for Sunday School. We had a lesson that was facil facilitated by Minister Michael Edwards, Jr., and was called God of Power. And it came from Revelation chapter 11, verses 15 through 19. So when you get an opportunity, please tune in to Facebook or YouTube to follow up with this morning's Sunday School lesson. Next week's lesson is called Marriage of the Lamb. And it's going to be from Revelation chapter 19, verses 1 through 8. The background scripture is Revelation chapter 19. And the key verse for next week's lesson is, Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Please join us next week at 9 o'clock a.m. for Sunday School. And following um, Sunday School at 11 o'clock, we do our morning service. Before we get further into our service, let's have a word of prayer. Father God, we come to you in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. And we just thank you, Father, for your many blessings, Father God. We thank you, Father, for being our God. Yes, we thank you, Father, for being our creator. <clears throat> we thank you, Father, for saving us, Lord, and for redeeming us from our sins, Lord. We thank you, Father, for dying on the cross for us, Father God, because you paid that price that we could never pay, Lord. Yes. We thank you, Father, for eternal salvation with you, Lord, yes. just by accepting your name and the work that you've done for us, Lord. We thank you, Lord, because you're an awesome God. And you're worthy to be praised. Yes. Father God, we just present all to you, Father God. Our sick and our shunning, Father God. Those who are going through various medical issues, Father God. The depressed, Father God. Father God, those in the hospital, Father God. Those who suffer from COVID, Lord. Father God, we ask you, Lord, to watch over those who lost their homes, Father God. Father God, we ask you, Lord, to just protect them and keep them by your side, Lord. Father God, fill them with, their, with your love and your compassion, Lord. And Lord, give them what they need, Father God, to survive. And, Lord, we know that you, you touch hearts of men and women, Father God. Please, Lord, help us to answer the call that you give us, Lord, to help those in need. And we thank you, Father God. Father God, we just present all things to you. Just want to trust you for all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our morning scripture is going to come from Luke chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. And Minister... Um, Reverend Eccles will tell us exactly what his title is. I didn't write it down. But following me will be Minister in Training, Bashtar Eccles, with a Samaritan selection. But before we go on, just want to remind you that next Sunday is Communion Sunday. So if you don't have your communion cups, please let us know so we can get some cups out to you. Or you can always partake of some juice and crackers at your home as well. In addition, on November the 27th, the that Saturday after Thanksgiving, we will be doing our um, outreach ministry again. And for those who can help us out, we're still looking for blankets, um, sleeping bags, anything to help those who are still living on the streets that need some warmth because it's kind of cold out there right now. Mm -hmm. In your hearing, I'm going to be reading Luke chapter 7, verses 1 through um, 10. And I'm reading from the King James Version. Make sure. Yes. yes. <laughs> because I have so many different translations. I want to make sure I'm reading the right translation. Now, when he had ended all his sayings in the audience of the people, he entered into Capernaum. And a certain centurion servant who was nearer to him was sick and ready to die. And when he heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. And when he had came to Jesus, they besought him, instantly saying, that he was worthy for whom he should do this. For he loveth our nation, and he has built us a synagogue. Then Jesus went with them, and when he was now not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy that thou should enter under my roof. Wherefore, neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee, but say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. For I also am a man set under authority, had under me soldiers, and I say unto one, Go, and he goeth, and to another, Come, and he cometh, 
and to my servant, do this, and he did it. When, my Jesus, when Jesus heard this, these things, he marveled at him and turned him about and said unto the people that followed him, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And they that were sent, returning to the house, found the servant whole that had been sick. That was the reading of uh, chapter 7 of Luke, verses 7, excuse me, verses 1 through 10. Now, follow me, we'll be ministering, training, and bash titles. You go, girl. Good morning, family. Good morning. Good morning. Just to take him at his word and just to rest upon his promise, just to know what the saves the ministries we come forth into your homes and into wherever you are right now some of you are again at bedside bedside baptist wherever you are dwelling even now listening to us uh, on your way to work later on uh, we thank god for you taking this time out to just stop by and visit with the kingdom praise ministries we're grateful 
to uh, be in service to you and to the people of God. We thank God this morning. This morning, um, as has been uh, read in your hearing, uh, the text is lengthy, but the text is so full of so much information this morning that we'll let the Lord guide us as to um, what we'll touch upon. So many things that are so beyond me in this text, so many things that I grapple with and try to grasp. But as I pray, ask God today to please, Holy Spirit, be our guide as we seek to lift Jesus up. Our whole motive and our whole purpose is to glorify you in all things. Yes. So we present ourselves to you today, today as your servants, and we now trust your spirit to give a word to your people, O oh God. Yes. Bless your people. Speak to your people, O oh God. Yes. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh in this place, and in every household, this message so rich. We ask it in Jesus' name that you would have your way, O oh God. Let somebody be saved, somebody be delivered, somebody healed as a result of hearing your word today. And for this, we give you glory, we give you praise, we give you honor. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 Just for a few moments in your hearing, the ingredients of a great faith. The ingredients of a great faith. Um... When I came to this text during the week, we're in our series, by the way, we're dealing with faith. We just we defined faith like this one last week. Um, hold your hand up and say, uh, forsaking all, I trust him. Amen. Amen. y'all didn't even do it. <laughs> That's how you're going to remember. Forsaking all, forsaking all. I, I trust, trust him. him. Amen. What a good definition of faith to remember that in faith I'm abandoning everything about me and I'm now relying on him. Isn't that yeah. good? Amen. Hallelujah. That's the Christian life, isn't it? Yeah. It's a reliance, a dependence upon God. That's what faith is. Faith is not getting what I want. Faith is not claiming and naming what I want. Faith is trusting God for what he wants for me. That's a whole different picture, isn't it? Because what I want is skewed by my own selfish desires and will. But what he wants for me is just right for me. Yes. Yes. As we approach this text this morning, there's, a, there's this uh, illustration given, this story given uh, the, in Jesus' time, where there's this person, there's this man that, who is a, we're not giving his name, but we know he is a centurion. Mm -hmm. And what impressed me with this particular man is that this man had a, Jesus described it as a great faith. And this man had a great faith. And this great faith, the scripture tells us, verse 9, that Jesus marveled. Wow. This, that's too much for me, right? Maybe you can handle that. But you mean, Jesus marveled over this man. Why did he marvel over this man? Because this man had great faith. He marveled over this man. Now, we marvel over Jesus, don't we? Yeah. At least we should. Mm -hmm. He's an amazing God, isn't he? Yes, he is. And the people marveled over Jesus when they saw his miracles. And they should have. When they heard his teaching, they marveled. The same word marveled is used over and over again throughout the New Testament. People marveling, uh, amazed, surprised. But what kind of what kind of faith must this man have had to cause Jesus to marvel? Mm. And he only marveled one other time with the same word marvel in Scripture. And that was in Mark chapter 6. He went to his own hometown. And uh, they began to assess his ministry, and they began to, they, they had a, a great doubt of him. And the Bible says in Mark 6 and 6, he marveled because of their unbelief. Mm. And which side are you on this morning? Mm. <laughs> Is Jesus marveling? He there did, couldn't do many wonderful works because the unbelief was so strong in his own hometown. It's, it's your own hometown. That's a place where people uh, tend not to respect who you are. The experts are always trying to stand on it. Y'all get that later on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> somebody we don't know. That's an expert. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's hard to believe that God can raise up somebody right in your town. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hard to believe that God can raise somebody right under your nose. And that was their problem. They had great them. So Jesus marveled. I don't want him marveling at my unbelief. There were times in the Bible where he asked his disciples, uh, where is your faith? Mm -hmm. <laughs> he asked us, how is it that you have no faith? Mm -hmm. He says, O ye of little faith. But here he marvels at the faith of this man. And so I begin to ask in my heart, Bella, you know what I want to know? I want to know, well, how can I have great faith? Mm -hmm. That should be a question. 
How yes. can I get to the place of having great faith? Is there something in this text that's going to give me a way to have great faith? Any ingredients of great faith? That's where the title of the message comes from, ingredients of a great faith. We got to understand that in the text, Jesus is not, the Holy Spirit, when he gives us a word, he's giving us something not just to say, that's a nice story. He's given us something to teach us, to encourage our hearts, to let us see more clearly of who Jesus is. This man was a centurion. Let's get to know him just a little bit this morning. We don't know his name, but we know about the centurions. Whenever centurions are mentioned in the New Testament, it's always in a positive light. These guys were guys of great moral integrity. They knew how to obey orders. They were not men so much who went to pick a fight, but if a fight was there, they handled it. These men were, were, were brought up to uh, being military strategists and going from low uh, private life to uh, raise themselves up through hand-to-hand -hand combat and became leaders. Centurion has an idea that this man was uh, uh, over 100 men. We got to wear a century from Centurion. He was over 100 men, and this varied because some had more, some had little, but a random about figure, he had at least 100 people under him. All right? So he was a leader. He, this centurion was a man of, of conviction. And now we, but we see some unusual things in the text about this particular, the scripture says there was a certain centurion who had a servant who had become sick. And the Bible describes the sickness as a sickness that was killing him. Matthew's account tells us that he was paralyzed. And he was in great pain and torture. So the man was sick and in pain, and this centurion uh, now uh, uh, tells us something about the centurion. And I saw this first ingredient of a great faith. I saw that to have great faith, you've got to care about other people. Mm -hmm. Now we got to understand what was going on during this time. you got to understand this was not unheard of, that a centurion or would care for a servant. Servants were, were looked at as property. Servants were looked at. One farmer, one farmer said every year you have to uh, uh, get your new tools in and throw your new tools out. Your, your, your wagon and your slaves. So, so uh, 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 he, servants were looked at as instruments to get jobs done. Servants could have been killed at the will of their masters. Servants were treated as not people but as things. And most servants, once your usefulness was uh, gone, uh, they were thrown out or killed because they were no longer profitable to their masters. But here is a man who was concerned not about himself. He was concerned about his servant. And as you read down this word servant, later on the text tells us that this word servant in particular was used of a young boy. A young man. And this was normal during this day because this, this leader would now be a role model for younger generations. And they would attach a young uh, uh, trainee or disciple next to a strong leader so he can learn. But this young man must have got awfully close to his leader. Because when his leader, uh, when he got sick, the leader would say, okay, most leaders said, well, replace him and bring me another boy. He was concerned enough about this particular boy that he wanted to find help for him. So as a servant, as a, as a, as a, a to have a great faith, we cannot say we have a great faith and mistreat people. Mm -hmm. We cannot say that we have a great faith and we look at people no matter what their social status is. We have an uncaring, uncompassionate spirit. Mm -hmm. We should not be able to walk past people every day who have great needs and we got a dime or quarter that will help a little bit along the way. We, we, we get into a place in our society that everything we're cynical about everybody. We, we, don't want, we don't want to give to people because we're thinking ourselves, well, they made bad decisions and, and, and I'm not going to help them and enable them in their bad decisions. Then we miss the whole gospel. We miss the whole point of Christianity. We miss everything because I see a God who reached way down. Mm. Maybe you weren't where I was. I see a God who reached way down to someone who made a lot of bad decisions. I see a God who reached down to a person who made their own bed hard and had to lay in it. I see, I see a God who reached down. He didn't say pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. He said, you don't even have bootstraps. You have nothing to pull upon. 
That's what I see. So we, if we have that kind of mentality, we'll never have a great faith battle. We'll never have a great faith, a faith that will impress Jesus. You, you may tout and you may uh, have all the right uh, tapestries, the right clothes, and you may go to the right church and you may look the right part and everything outside is together. But how are you treating other people? Especially those who you deem as being lower in status than you are. You know, I, I talk to the doctors, but I won't talk to the custodian. Mm. I, I want to get to know the doctor. I want to get to know the president because he may have promotion for me. But I don't want to deal with somebody who can't offer me anything. And that's the mentality often today that if you can't be something to me, if you can't add something to my life, I have no use for you. And that's a narcissistic attitude. That's when we become our own God. That's when man begins to worship his own self. Because if you're not valuable to me, I have no value for you. Mm. And we get to that place, anybody who messes with our Godhood, <laughs> anybody who talks about me, anybody who doesn't like me, anybody who doesn't accept me, I have no use for you. And that is a self Worship. We begin to worship ourselves and not the true living God. Because the true living God is not like that. The true living God, the whole purpose of what he does is that he loves. He reaches the unreachable. And so if you would have a, a strong faith, a great faith, you have to watch how you treat people. Amen. We got to watch how we treat. No, we don't get it all right all the time. We ought to be trying to be better because you know what happens? We treat people better when we see the gospel. Mm -hmm. Every time you find some weakness in your life, some attitude developing in your life, you got to go back to the cross. Yep. Somebody don't understand this, but there's power yeah. mm -hmm. in the cross. We got to learn how to look back to the cross and realize that if it wasn't for the grace of God, I would be a lost sinner undone. Yes. If it wasn't for God's grace, I would be lost. I would have no hope. I would have no God in this world. I'd be caught up in my sin if it wasn't for God's grace. Mm -hmm. And instead of coming away huffing and high and hot money, you come by saying, I'm grateful. Hey, anybody got a grateful praise this morning? Yeah. I'm just grateful, God. Anybody grateful that God saved you? Yeah. You think you did something to merit? We did nothing to merit that salvation. So here's the centurion. The centurion here is a man of great prestige, but yet he looked out for his servant. He looked out to a servant to the place that he wanted to take that servant to the best place he knew how to take him. Mm -hmm. The Bible says he heard about Jesus. How do you know that's, that's the starting point? Because the Bible, we talked about it last week. How does faith come? Faith is not something we make up in our hearts or we say, I'm going to believe, I'm going to believe. No, faith cometh. Hey, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. How many know we need a word from God? Yeah. Yeah. If you're going to have your faith to be a great faith, you got to have an ear for the word of God. Amen. And now, I know, obviously, I love to hear good preach. I love this teacher. But you know what? We love to hear it. But when it comes to translating it into what we do, it's not that love. I hear people say all the time, I know what the Bible says, but. I know what the scripture says, but. And I see your post <laughs> on Facebook and Instagram where you're trying to get back at people. You're trying to uh, uh, dismiss people because they did something or said something to you. That's not the spirit of Christ. Mm -hmm. I want to knock on the door this morning. I want to be like Jesus, knocking on the door of your heart, saying, let the Lord come in. Yes. Because the Lord comes in, you'll see he was a spouse, mm -hmm. and he was rejected. He was a man acquainted with sorrow and grief. He was a man who was spit upon, but yet on the cross, he can say, Father, hey, y'all hear him saying on the cross, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. Can you hear him saying that today? We got to go back to the cross and realize the cross has the power to break my ego. The cross has the power to break my godhood. The cross has the power to take the self-worship from me. And realize like the centurion, the centurion wouldn't even come to Jesus on his own. The centurion sent some Jewish people because he was not Jewish. He sent some Jewish leaders to go over and, and tell Jesus to come on to my house. I got a servant, and I know you can fix him. You got to understand, it's a lot in that. It's a whole lot in that because you got to understand that the, the uh, centurions were occupiers for Jewish people. They looked at them as occupiers. 
They had came into their land and, and were taking control. Uh, when centurions in the land met, centurions were there to keep peace and to collect, make sure taxes were, collect, were collected. So you got the, the Jews who land, they say it's ours. Money being taken from them to give to Rome. And you have centurions there to enforce these kind of things in that land. So Jews and centurions were actually enemies. They were actually didn't get along because the Jews look at the centurion as being dirty. And a, a, a centurion looking at the Jew as being worthless. So you got these two people, but yet this centurion had a way and a love. The Bible says he loved the nation. He had a way and a love. This word love is agape. Akapao. Agape. The God kind of love. So this centurion shows evidence that he had in some way heard Jesus and he had a good, a, a, a changed heart. Because nobody loves their enemies except somebody who's been transformed. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah, somebody. This man had been touched to the place, not only did he love his servant, he also loved the Jews. And when the Jewish leaders came to Jesus, they came leaders who wouldn't even accept Jesus themselves. Because this man meant so much to them, they broke down and said, we'll go and talk to Jesus for you. That man has a lot of influence, y'all. Mm -hmm. And for the Jewish leaders to go and represent an occupying nation to a Jewish rabbi and one who wasn't accepted fully as a Jewish rabbi, a poor Jewish rabbi, walking the streets preaching, that was like unheard of. So that's not just a amazing great faith going here. That's amazing gentlemen God is using. Amen, somebody. Amen. That's amazing man that God is using. That's amazing man that God is, is, is working through his life. To the place that he has influence even with the enemies. To the place that he has influence with those who are against him. So we got to understand, my brothers and sisters, if we come to this place, we come into a place of seeing amazement after amazement. And I see him here, not only a man of, 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 of caring, he's a man of means. He's got money. You know how I know he has money? Because the Bible says here, the Jews came to Jesus and they said he's worthy. He's worthy of this. The centurion is worthy of you coming to his house because this man, we love him. Oh, they didn't say we like this man, we, we, we tolerate him. He loves us and we love him. And also he said he built a synagogue. My Lord, this man, the centurion took his own money and built the Jews a synagogue. What was the purpose of a synagogue? The synagogue was a place of teaching, a place of learning. So this man loved the word of God enough to build a house for the Jews. So we see a whole lot in, this, in these two verses. A whole lot about this individual. We don't know his name, but we know a lot about him. We know he's a man of faith. We know he's a man of love. We know he's a man who's been touched by God's hand. So this centurion sends people. He sends this coalition over. So we got to understand, not only is he caring, he's a man of means, but he's also a man of humility. Mm -hmm. If you're going to have great faith, you got to understand how you look. You got to understand what we really deserve. You got to understand that we can't walk in and have a great faith and be arrogant. We got to understand that arrogance and faith do not go together. Like oil and water don't mix. You can shake it together all you want. When it all settles down, they don't mix together. We got to understand that, that faith and, 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 and arrogance does not go together. Because Bible, the Bible says that, he was, that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Amen. This man had a good understanding. He felt so bad about who he was. Although he had clout, he had money. He still realized there's something about Jesus. That he wasn't even deserving to go. So he sent some people who were Jewish leaders there to talk to Jesus. And they asked Jesus to come, and Jesus said, I'll go to him. And then when they got close to the man's house, you know what happened? The man sent another word out. He got some friends together this time, and he said, don't come. And what do you want? They want him to come or don't come? He's, he goes on his way to go to, to the to the Sertarian's house. And then the Sertarian, when he gets close, says, don't come. And he says that, says, says, sends a message to these people. He, keep in mind, this man has never met Jesus face to face, only heard about him. But yet he demonstrates a great faith. 
He says what? He says that, tell Jesus not to come here. He says, why? Not because I think I'm so great he's got to come to me. But he says, tell him not to come because I'm not worthy for him to come under my roof. You got to understand what's going on here. It wasn't legal by the laws of tradition for a Jewish leader or a Jew to go into a Gentile's house. But Jesus was willing to go. Mm. Amen. Because you know, you know why they couldn't go? They thought coming into a Gentile's house would contaminate them so they could not go to a synagogue. They could not go to worship. But Jesus was not tied down by uh, traditions of men. And, and, and there were Old Testament laws and rules about if you touch something holy, it would be unholy. If you were unclean, you touch, something un, you, you touch something holy, that thing would be unclean. But not so with Jesus. Because Jesus, he touched stuff to change. Yes. He wasn't supposed to uh, uh, touch lepers. He wasn't supposed to be in the, in the company of those who were blind. These, all these things were looked at for the Jews as being defilement. But when Jesus came along, what did he do? He changed things. Yes. He has the power. How many know Jesus got the power? So this centurion here, I'm trying to tell you this story, goes to Jesus, sends some, a delegation to Jesus, and says, don't come because I'm not worthy. Y'all got to understand that, that the Jews said he was worthy. The Jews are trying to say he was worthy. Why? Because he loves us. He loves our people. This man was not anti-Semitic. He loved the Jewish people. He understood that Jewish people were God's chosen people. He understood and embraced them for that. This man, this man was worthy because he loved our people. How many know we are praying for those who like us? Mm. <laughs> we talk to God about those who accept us. And they had the idea, and the Jews always had a meritorious type attitude that you got to God by merits. But they didn't understand that that's not how salvation comes. That if you do certain things, it merits you. When Jesus comes to your house, it's not because you deserve it. It's all because we don't deserve it. But this man knew he didn't deserve it. He says, don't come here because I'm not worthy. So to have great faith, you got to realize this, that you're not worthy. you got to realize that we're not worthy of anything God gives us. This man would not, so he knew that Jesus was more than just a, 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 a miracle worker. He knew that Jesus had power. He knew that Jesus was holy. Do you know, that's the next thing you got to know to have great faith. you got to understand who Jesus is. you got to understand who he is because Great faith comes by those who understand how great their God is. This man understood because he was a leader. He said, when I tell somebody to do something, they do it. And when I tell somebody to go, they go. He says, the Lord, you don't have to come under my, under my roof to heal this dying servant. All you got to do is say a word. How many know the word of God's got power? Yes. He said, all you got to do is say a word. What does that mean? That means that he believed that Jesus had Great authority. He believed that Jesus had great power. I wonder how many believed that Jesus had great power. Yes. He said all you got to do is say a word. He said he knew that if Jesus just spoke it, it would happen. That's not something we can do. That's something God does. Yes. That's something God does. His word is powerful. And how many know you were saved by a word? Did God send a word and save you? Has God sent a word and healed you? Has God sent a word to save you and deliver you? All you got to do, Jesus, is say a word. And Jesus heard what this man said. You got to understand that this man believed in Jesus. He believed that he had power. This was a man of authority. He understood what it was to have authority. He had authority over humans. But he knew Jesus had authority over disease. Yes. He knew Jesus had authority over anything. How many of y'all know Jesus got authority over anything? Yes. So what are you going through? What are you going through today? What kind of situation you're going through that Jesus doesn't have authority over? You got to understand that just because Jesus has the power doesn't mean he's going to do everything you think and I think he ought to do. Him having the power and him expressing his power, he does in his own way. Because the man said, you, by authority, you can send someone here or send someone there. So Jesus has the power. In other words, to have great faith, you got to recognize Jesus as Lord. You got to understand, I'm throwing you a lot of tidbits today. Hope you write these things down. Jesus, what does that mean, Lord? That means he called him Lord. That means that he's in control. That means that he is sovereign over our lives. That means that he is the one who calls the shots. I know we like to name it and claim it and grab it and bag it, but if that's not God's will for your life, guess what? No matter how much you name it and claim it and try to grab it, you'll never bag it because God is in control. And what we want sometimes is far from what God wants. His thoughts are so far above our thoughts. His ways were so far above our ways. Years ago when I was a young Christian, I used to 
I was in the name and claim it. I was in the name and claim it game. Now I just believe that whenever you ask and believe, God had to give it to you the way you wanted it done. And my aunt was sick, and she was a person who was worthy. My aunt was sick with cancer, and my wife and I prayed continuously for her and claimed her healing. And she came back one time in remission. She got in the service of the Lord, then the cancer came back. And the next time it came back aggressively. And so we, in our little minds, thinking, uh, God, it, it came back and took her the second time. We, in our minds, thinking, well, God failed us. God didn't do everything we thought he should do. And our faith wasn't strong enough to bring her healing. And that's what the idea of this name and claim it gospel has all mixed up. People are getting disillusioned when they don't get what they pray and name and claim. And they say, God doesn't do that. God doesn't answer prayers. Well, you got to understand that God is in control. And little did I understand back then what God says about this. God says absent from the body, present with the Lord. And although we wanted to keep her on this side, God said it was time for her to go and be with him. And so in my selfish mindset, I was praying out of my own selfish mindset, Lord, don't do these things. But little did I understand that God had a greater plan. How many know that God's got more sense than you got? Yes. God has a greater plan. And what I need to do is stop trying to insist on my way and insist on him having his way. Jesus even did it, didn't he? Not what I will, but thou be done. If Jesus had to do it, how much more than I have to do it? Not what I want, but what you want. Because what God wants is right. What God wants is good for me. We got to understand here that Jesus saw that kind of faith. Jesus saw a faith that he said, I didn't see anybody else in Israel have it. This man wasn't even a Jew. This man didn't have the Old Testament laid out for him like they did. This man didn't profess to be anything. He was just doing his job, and he heard about Jesus. And I'm here to tell you today that if you're going to have a strong faith, you got to have a faith in the power of God. you got to have faith to know that God can do and will do what he wants to do the way he wants to do it. So this man marveled Jesus with his faith. It, Jesus was marveled and surprised by his faith. Not surprised in the sense that he didn't know what was going to happen, but amazed because when he said, I've not found so kind of, this such kind of faith. This kind of faith, I've not found it anywhere. And he said to the man, he went, and the man went home, and guess what? His servant was here. So great faith brings about great results. When you got your faith in God, you got to understand that God will do what he said he would do. God will open doors when he said he opened doors. God will make a way. It may not be exactly the way I want it, but you got to understand, sometimes God will let you go through stuff and put you in this thing called process. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. You ask God for something, and God may say, I'm going to grant it to you, but i got to get you ready for the blessing. you got to understand, you may be going through some things right now to get you ready for what God has for you. But beware, because when God, when you're in process, Satan will send counterfeits. Yes. That's why you always got to be discerning. Right. You always got to have your eyes open. You can't jump at the first thing that comes your way. You got to be discerning and know, is this from God or is this from the devil? You got to be able to say, is this from God? If it's from God, it's going to enhance who I am in Christ. Mm -hmm. If it's of the devil, it's going to pull me away from what I'm doing for God. Mm -hmm. If something pull you away from God, it's not of God. Because God will not put something in your life that will pull your heart away from him. Yes. So if he mean that much to you, you got to let him go. Amen, somebody. Yeah. If money means that much to you, you got to let it go. Anything that blocks your path, anything that hinders you, whatever you have your eyes on, even if it's you in the way, you got to let yourself go. The Bible says, if any man come after me, he must deny himself. What does that mean? That means I got to set my own self. What I want, take this cross. I got to be willing to do what God called me to do and follow him. And how many know that's not always going to be days where there's no tears and no sorrows? You have to cry sometimes. You have to go through some things sometimes. But if you have great faith, you got to learn how to trust in God. Amen. If you have great faith, you got to learn how to treat people. Amen. If you have great faith, you've got to humble yourself. If you have great faith, you got to know who Jesus is, understand his authority. If you have great faith, you got to trust God with all your soul and all your mind. You got to learn how to trust him. Amen, somebody. You got to learn how to put your faith in him. Because you look at the ingredients of this great faith. You got to ask yourself now, where do I stand? Where do I stand in measurement of my faith? 
Where am I? Am I at the place where Jesus is saying, where is your faith? Mm -hmm. Am I at the place where he said, how is it? After all I've done for you, that you have no faith. Mm -hmm. Am I at the place where he said, why you are what? Little faith. Mm -hmm. Or am I at the place where he turns around and turns back and testifies? That's what he did. He turned around because the man wasn't there. But the people he sent were there, and all the many Jews and those who followed him, thousands who followed him at this time, he turned around and says, I have not found so great a faith, a faith like this, no, not Israel. And what they must have done to the Jews. Mm -hmm. Here's a man who's not even a Jew, but he's found great faith. It lets me know something else. And Jesus looked for something. He said, I have not found. That means Jesus is looking for somebody to believe the report. Amen. I wonder if he can look at you and say you believe. Mm -hmm. The Bible, Isaiah asked the question, who has believed our report? And unto whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Where is your faith this morning? That's the question I want to challenge each one of us with. That's the question I challenge myself with this week as I look over this passage of scripture and ask God, well, how did this man arrive at this faith? It's all laid out in the text. Amen. All laid out in the text there. So I thank God for you today. I'm asking my son to come. He does not close in prayer. Thank you, Lord, for once again visiting this family, this household, this spiritual kingdom praise ministry for you, Lord. Thank you for everybody on the sound of our voice, our voices today. Allow them to be blessed, walk away with something that will enrich them spiritually, emotionally, mentally. Allow them to be closer to you, Lord. Allow them to be able to seek your face, not just your hand. Lord, thank you for once again bringing us all through a, a, another trying week. Um, I know my life has been crazy. I, I can only imagine the, the millions of lives that you keep under your, under your control, Lord. We want to say thank you. We don't take that for granted. Thank you, Lord. Lord, please bless this ministry to allow us to reach as many people as possible. Go beyond what we plan to do. Make it your plans, Lord. And show us the way that you want us to go. Let us know how you want us to grow. Let us direct our path. If you're not directing it, we don't want it, Lord. Let us know what you want. Make it obvious to us, Lord. We are stupid. We're your people. But we, we're dumb sheep. Just, just guide us where you want us to go. Because we know that you will lead us to still waters. Lord, please bless everybody in the sound of my voice. Allow them to go forth in their daily lives. And allow them to do something that's going to draw more people to you, Lord. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't just seek salvation for ourselves. We seek it for everybody that we come in contact with. We want everybody to go to heaven. We know it's not possible for everybody to because the pride of man is so strong. But let us see. Let us seek your way, your will, and draw more people to you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. God bless you, my family. We're so excited to stop by and be with us today. I pray, that, I pray today that somehow that you will glean something from this message today that will encourage your faith. Something to recognize that great faith doesn't come automatically. Great faith comes through a growing faith. Great faith comes through an appreciation of who Jesus Christ is. And once you really know him, Everything else falls in place. And this knowing of him is not only present, but it's also progressive. Amen. Amen. I know him, but I'll not know him. I'll know him better, a little better next week. But I'm going to keep on searching, to keep Amen. on seeking, keep on praying. Amen. Amen. So Paul even said that I might know him and the power of his resurrection. So Paul, with all the knowledge God given him, was still in a position of growing. And I pray this where you find yourself in man, as a place of growing. Some of us are walking back. We're walking back from uh, things we know to do right. And I want to implore you today to don't walk backwards, walk forward. Mm -hmm. Get closer to God. He said, if you draw nigh to me, I'll draw nigh to you. So we got to understand we draw nigh to God through prayer, through reading of his word, and through applying his word. We draw closer and we make our minds up. We want to lift him, asking his Holy Spirit to infuse our lives to the place that we are, are filled with the spirit of God and led by God's spirit. 
and all the things we do and say, you'll find your life being transformed in a wonderful way. For you'll be free from uh, so much bondage of trying to be something, trying to impress people. You'll be free from people's opinions and their likes and dislikes because all you want to do is please God. Amen. Amen. That's the direction God will direct your life in, and it's liberating because you're free from these so many hang-ups and so many uh, isms and schisms out here. And when the false gospel comes forth, you recognize it right away. Mm -hmm. People are always trying to work their way into heaven. The Jews were saying he's worthy. That man said, no, I'm not worthy. Amen. Mm -hmm. I want to agree with him today. No, I'm not worthy. But God is worthy. Amen. Amen. He's worthy of all things. God bless you today. May heaven smile upon your home. And before we close today, I just want to offer Christ to someone. From the sound of my voice. If you have not have received Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, take one moment. Take a moment and say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. Be my Savior and be my Lord. I acknowledge that I'm a sinner and I need you to save me. No other means of salvation except Jesus Christ. And I ask you to now save me and make me what you want me to be. In Jesus' name I pray. If you pray that prayer from your heart, he comes in. He begins to do work in your life. God bless you, my family. We love you. From my home to yours, King Praise Ministry, signing out.